Thank you. Um, and as mentioned, I, I have a background in an area called positive psychology. And what is that exactly? Well, traditionally in psychology, we have this book. And it's called the DSM-5. And essentially, it lists everything that can possibly go wrong with us uh, psychologically. And it occurred to, to some that, you know what, even if we cured the entire world of everything that is in this book, we would merely have neutral people and societies. That the absence of illness, the absence of pathology, is not necessarily uh, the presence of flourishing health and happiness. And just like we have a book that lists everything that's wrong with us, that maybe, and everything we're trying to get rid of, maybe we should have a book that ident identifies everything that's right with humanity, and everything that we're attempting to build. So rather than what we're trying to go away from, what are we trying to go towards? So of course, the topic today is that of a rebel. And what are some of the barriers to becoming uh, this rebel? Well, it is literally like swimming against the tide. That, you know, this, maybe a stereotypical view is that it's, it's difficult. Uh, it, it might be even sacrificial in some ways. Um, and that this is this struggle against this oppressive and unjust uh, status quo. Um, what I wanted to contribute today is that this journey as a rebel or rebel rebellious pursuit uh, doesn't necessarily have to be miserable and lonely. So I wanted to go over some, some evidence about not just how we might change the world for the better, but how we might also enjoy this experience. So I'm going to go through some evidence from positive psychology, uh, evolutionary psychology, as well as brain science, uh, going over five somewhat random points, uh, but hopefully progressive ones, uh, on how we can obtain uh, not just a, a change in the world, but some personal happiness along the way as well. That these things aren't mutually exclusive, and that we can have both. So, sometimes th the causes choose us. We know there are many great, uh, great uh, movements uh, that the cause chooses the leader. But what I want to suggest is that if possible, choose a cause that genuinely uh, that to choose a cause that generally leads to happiness for you and others. Now, this may seem painfully obvious, but uh, let me suggest something that's not obvious. Is that as we are almost comically bad at actually choosing the things that will, will truly lead to our greatest happiness for ourselves and others. Let me give you a prominent example. Uh, is to give the example of conjoined twins. That often, as people in societies, we go to great length uh, to separate them. Uh, sometimes risking one, uh, one or both of their lives in the process. Yet, when we ask adult conjoined twins uh, years later, some well over 90% of them would not wish to be separated. And then if we, we do some studies about how happy they are, they're virtually as happy as the rest of us. There's also some 80 things that the average person lists would be worse than death. That if that happened to us, uh, pull the plug. But when you actually interview people that have those conditions and those illnesses, once again, the suicides rates aren't significantly higher. And, um, and again, they're virtually as happy as the rest of us. So why are we so bad at this, at actually choosing things that actually lead to our greatest happiness? Well, there's some, there's some brain gaps that happen with, the, with the, uh, the neuroscience. So this is the work of a guy named Daniel Gilbert. And he wrote a book called Stumbling, Stumbling on Happiness. Um, in a bunch of studies, and he referred to uh, an act of prospection. Um, and so that's the act of, can we go back on that one? That's, that's the act of uh, looking in the future and, see, and assessing how things might make us feel. So there's three main factors that prevent us from accurately predicting things. One is we fill in the blanks. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, they do studies of people after significant events. So getting married, uh, also graduating from high school and they asked people to describe those events and how it made them feel at the time. And then years later, they asked them again to remember the event and how it made them feel. Years later, we rate, on average, we rate the experience as either far more positive or far more negative than actually occurred. So what's happening here? What happens is we take the prevailing emotion from that event. We can't remember everything. It's, it's inefficient. We take that prevailing emotion from the, that event and we fill in all the details we forgot based on the prevailing emotion. So if it was positive, 
All the details are filled in as being slightly more positive. If it's negative, slightly more, uh, slightly more negative than actually occurred. And if we know this, we can get more sophisticated in choosing. The other thing we do, the brain trick that happens, is we project the present onto the future. We tend to think we're going to feel in the future as we're feeling right now. Uh, a prime example of this, so if we're feeling bad, we tend to think we're going to feel bad in the future. Feeling good right now, we tend to think we're feeling good. The prime example, go to the grocery store when you're hungry. What happens? You make, you make uh, bad decisions. We buy too much food because we tend to think we're going to be hungry all the time. Uh, but the future is different, so it is more sophisticated. And finally, perhaps most importantly, is we underestimate our abilities to adapt to both negative and positive situations. We have an almost inspiring ability, a, a tr actually truly inspiring ability, to, to adapt to negative circumstances and events that we're extraordinarily resi resilient. They're never usually as bad as we think they are and that we can usually rise to the occasion. Also, we have a tremendous ability to adapt to, to uh, positive things like comforts and luxuries. And therefore, we don't tend to get as much happiness from those things as we think. We adapt really quickly and, generally speaking, get no more happiness there than we did uh, at the previous location we were at. Uh, so if we know these things, we can transcend them. Uh, so things we can do. What does the research say uh, uh, leads to happiness for the majority of people? So bear with me for this, this particular moment. What someone felt after going through a particular event is a better indication how, of how we would feel than how we think we would feel. So in that case, we have something to learn from other people that go through particular events, um, particularly in the science. If we get a bunch of people that go through a particular event uh, and how that made them feel is likely how we're going to feel as well. If it made them happy, it's likely to make us happy as well. Um, but we are truly unique as well that after that baseline, understanding what truly leads to happiness for the majority of us, uh, we, can, we can get this emotional intelligence of really understanding what truly leads to happiness for us, for an intimate understanding uh, of our own uh, our feelings and, and, um, and pursuits. <clears throat> so I want to take another point. Uh, this is from positive psychology and a bit of the brain science as well. Is that happiness and success comes more from using our strengths than from getting rid of our weaknesses. Um, remember we talked about the book, so we, we also need a book that identifies everything that's right with humanity and everything we're trying to build. Well, they did this. Uh, Christopher Peterson and Martin Sligeman, uh, they got a bunch of researchers and they got them together and they read what they called virtue textbooks. Everything from Aristotle to Plato, the Old Testament, Confucius, um, the Quran, um, Benjamin Franklin, even things like the Boy Scout Handbook. And they said, what do all of these sort of traditions, what do they all have in common? Yes, they have difference, but what do they all value? What they found was that almost every single one of these traditions flung us 3,000 years and the entire face of the earth endorsed six core virtues and 24 signature strengths. So they've done studies on this. And they find that the higher you are on any of these core virtues or any of these signature strengths, also the happier you're likely to be. But what I wanted to mention today was, if you go to AuthenticHappiness.org and you fill in, <coughs> you fill in uh, a questionnaire, it's about a 250 question, uh, question questionnaire there, it will come up with your top five signature strengths. And <coughs> they have studies now that suggest that, that if you use those strengths more in everything you're doing, and more importantly here, if you choose pursuits that encompass those particular strengths, you're more likely to be happy and, we'll say, successful as well. <clears throat> also, the happiest people satisfy the needs formed by, by both individual and group selection. So this is evidence coming from evolutionary psychology. So just like we have uh, natural selection has, has formed our, our physical characteristics, like opposable thumbs, it's also given us some psychological predispositions. So we have a fundamental need to have s some of these individual things, to have some sort of effectance on the world, uh, to have some sort of impact and influence uh, that have our desires and our unique needs, needs met. So exceptionally happy people and successful people have this individual pursuit uh, that engages them and absorbs them in some sort of uh, uh, meaningful effort. But they also know that the happiest people uh, 
they also, their individual pursuits also contribute to something larger than themselves. Uh, and they usually have these in-groups. So we're also formed by group selection. So we get a good feeling when, uh, when we help someone else, and they also help us, and we both raise each other. But the, that the humans that, that display those characteristics, those benevolent characteristics, were more likely to survive and pass on that kind disposition. So if we have individual pursuits that lead to group goals, uh, as well as meaningful relationships within that in-group, a sort of place of effortless belonging, this could be family, it could be at school, this could be in a team, uh, far more likely to be happy. And finally, as humans, we have a need for the divine or the transcendent to contribute to something larger than just us, larger just than our group, but just to the collective at large. And that the people that have vertical coherence between these things, that their individual pursuits lead to group goals, and that their group goals lead to something larger than both them and their group, these are the people that are most likely to be happy, and again, I would suggest uh, successful in changing the world for the better as well. Another point from, uh, from neuroscience, we're saying how we pursue our goals may be as important as the goals we choose to pursue. So let me explain what this means. So we have that ancient wisdom that it's the journey that matters more than the destination. Well, this, is, this ancient wisdom is getting some modern day credibility. Um, so Richard Davison studied the psychology of rewards at the neurological level, leading him to what is known in scientific circles as the progress principle. So this pleasure comes more from making progress towards goals than from uh, achieving them. Um, so this is the, the idea that our brains light up uh, longer and stronger while we're making progress towards goals than it does when we actually achieve them. When we achieve them, we get this big sp uh, spike in activity that, that dissipates relatively quickly. So here's one of the ironies of goals, that the purpose of goals, at least according to this, is not necessarily to achieve them. The purpose of goals is to engage us in the moment. And it's that engagement in the everyday work uh, um, that seems to lead to both happiness uh, in that engagement as well as, as the desired outcome that we want. What I want to end with is, is whatever you're doing, don't forget the happiness advantage. And what is this? Well, traditionally, as, you, as I'm sure you're aware, we've, we've thought of getting happiness as this, that we work hard, and if we work hard, we get success, and that if we get success, then we'll achieve happiness. Well, it turns out there's lots of evidence suggesting that we have this somewhat backwards. That if we're happy, that we're more likely to be engaged in what we're doing. We're more likely to develop real reciprocal relationships where we help people and they help us and we both lift each other. That we're more likely to come up, to you, we're more likely to come up with unique solutions to problems uh, and creative solutions. Uh, that, we're, that we're less likely, that we're more likely to be healthy um, and, and engaged in what we're doing. Um, and that leads to, uh, to, to more success and happiness in the moment as well. So the idea that I wanted to leave you with today uh, was this idea of that not only uh, if we do it intelligently can we truly change the world for the better, um, but that we might just enjoy it uh, as well if we do it in this way. So, that's the idea for me that's worth spreading. Thank you.